democratic governance is not a new uh, concept in development literature, uh, but for the context of our discussion today, it would be good for us to, to get a general understanding of what corporate governance means. So if you could briefly describe to us what is corporate governance in general, and then bring it down to the continent. What does it mean for the African continent? Well, so very broadly and in general terms, corporate governance is a system of rules. It's a system of processes by which a company or companies are controlled and directed. It is also a system by which such a company and the actors within the company make their own decisions, either in relation to what goes on within the company or how the company engages with its external environment. So very broadly, that's what it means. And in Africa as well, we have adopted the same kind of description with regards to how we define corporate governance, with regards to also how we, we implement some of the different factors that form part of the corporate governance discipline. So then tell us a little bit as to the challenges that face state-owned enterprises or SOEs in Africa. What are some of the root causes of the challenges that cripple SOEs on the continent? So you're quite correct. Um, you know, as the African peer review mechanism, we've, under, we've undertaken quite extensive studies um, in relation to corporate governance within a state-owned enterprise sector in Africa. And as you have rightly pointed out, there are serious challenges that um, SOEs are facing within the continent. And those challenges range are very broad. However, what we've discovered through the work that we've done is that at the foundation of the challenges being faced by SOEs on the continent, at the root cause is poor corporate governance practices that have either not been implemented or in the case where they do exist, where there, is, there are no clear mechanism that drive how these entities should be governed and controlled either by the state, which is the owner, or by the executives themselves, which are um, responsible for the operations of the entity. I think it's important when we speak about SOEs to also remember why it is important, why corporate governance is important for SOEs. It's important for the mere simple fact, but very fundamental fact, that an SOE is a corporate entity that is incorporated in accordance with national laws and directed by the state, not on its own behalf, but on behalf and in the interest of the general population. Mm -hmm. So the mere fact that the state owns and directs an entity on behalf of the general population in our minds justifies a much higher level of accountability, a much higher level of transparency when it comes to dealing with the SOEs and how it engages with its stakeholders and, and then of course how it is governed internally. And so that is why it is such an important aspect of an, of, of, of an SOE, of the health of the SOE, of the sustainability of the state-owned enterprise. We've heard about the challenges um, that really face and cripple our SOEs. So what then should be done? So for example, in terms of the regulatory systems, what should be done? Well, I mean, you know, when we talk about what needs to be done, we first need to have done some kind of a, a diagnostic process to say what it, what it is that is actually going wrong at the moment when it comes to SOEs. And again, through the work that we've done, what we have found is that there is often a very no clear framework that's been put in place by governments with regards to the rationale, number one, for owning the SOEs, but also with regards to a clarity of the mandate of the SOE. So most SOEs operate on a commercial basis, but we also know that there are SOEs that have been put into place for public policy objectives. And oftentimes you find that SOEs don't have a clear mandate from the state as to why they exist. So you will find that um, in the instance where SOEs have to undertake both commercial um, objectives as well as public policy objectives without the necessary 
direction from the state and without the necessary framework being put in place, you find that there's then very little accountability and transparency. Ms. Toomey, you started to touch a bit about the importance of the board of directors. Um, some have, have pointed to the often very politicized nature of board appointees and also unclear mandates, which you have also spoken to. Um, how true is this? And if it is true, what can be done? Well, you know, um, we have found that it's, it's actually quite true. And I must say that this is not something that only is an issue for Africa. I think it's an issue in most other economies. Um, because SOEs are controlled by governments, it's therefore often um, translated to mean that a government can then appoint uh, board members you know, which is true. However, what is important is we go back to why SOEs exist. You know, they exist for the benefit of the general public, of the population. And so therefore, if you are going to appoint directors, there should be a clear framework in terms of how that is done. And that's often missing. So there should be a clear framework in terms of the, the skills that are necessary for the people that will be appointed on the board, that there should be a diversity of skills, there should be a clear role and responsibilities, that the directors are clear about what their roles and responsibilities are, and that they act in the best interest of the company and not in the best interest of the shareholder, which is um, the state. There should also be very clear rules that are put in place with regards to the remuneration of such um, non-executive directors who sit on the board. There should also be very clear rules that are put in place around how the executives of the entity themselves engage with the board and ongoing performance appraisals should be done to ensure that first of all, do we still need these board members? And to what extent can they be supported? Because oftentimes we will talk about how board members interfere but there's also a level of there is a need to support them and give them information and education on their roles and responsibilities. So with all of this learning that, that, uh, and examples of what can be done that you're telling us, Ms. Toomey, what can we also learn from a very important sector, which is the private sector? Are there things that we can pick um, and learn from them that we can then use in corporate governance? Absolutely. You know, um, it's very unfortunate that the public sector in terms of SOE sector has not received the same level of um, the same level of attention as far as improving corporate governance as much as um, um, the private sector has. So there's a lot that we can learn from there and there's a lot that we can learn in a positive way and also on some of the negative things that are happening within the private sector. But in terms of some of the positives that are happening, um, you will often find in a country that um, countries have codes of corporate governance, but these codes of corporate governance tend to apply to the private sector. And so we will need, in my view, to have some form of guidelines on the continent, principles and guidelines that are directed specifically at state-owned enterprises. And I think this will go a very long way in assisting our member states, in assisting the governments to say, how do we structure these entities so that they achieve the objectives for which they were set and those objectives so that they generate the level of employment that we want to see in the countries so that they contribute to the GDP as they were intended to and also so that they, they play a key role in the development of our economies, which is why they were put in place. And one of the things we could, we were just talking about board appointments, for instance. One of the things that the private sector does well is the training and support of non-executive directors. And the mm -hmm. fact that they are very, very careful about choosing and appointing a certain caliber of a person with the necessary skills that they bring into the company. We of course know that we're operating in, in a global context and corporate governance also operates in this, uh, within this uh, context. Um, and I'm just curious, is, is there pressure from that global international level that affects our journey in Africa in terms of how we're progressing in corporate governance? 
you know, more and more our companies, both in the private sector and in the public sector, are beginning to um, engage and to operate on a global stage. And that comes with its own um, dynamics. And, and part of that dynamic is to say that if you are going to be operating on a global stage, there's an expectation that you bring along with you the same level of standards, same level of practices. So yes, I would say that there is that kind of pressure, but that kind of pressure should not necessarily be coming from, um, from outside externally. You know, it should come from inside simply because we recognize the need for the sustainability of SOEs. Um, you know, so what we've tended to do on the continent with regards to that kind of pressure is because corporate governance, corporate governance is still in its infancy on the continent. You know, it wasn't um, until 1994 that we saw the first set of corporate governance codes coming to effect on the continent, um, the King Code of Corporate Governance. So I would say it's still very much new. And out of 55 member states in Africa, only 19 have corporate governance codes that are, have been put in place. And so basically what that means is that Africa on its own still has a lot um, to learn, still has a lot to achieve. And with that need to develop our own corporate governance or to improve corporate governance, we've tended to look at how developed economies have done, or we've tended to also borrow and import some of their own right. frameworks and put them into our, you know, um, environment on the continent. So I just think with that pressure to say, how do we ensure that we emulate perhaps some of the more developed economies with the importation then of these frameworks, what we have missed as a continent is the fact that our systems or our economies are not as well developed as, for instance, some of the Western um, economies. So our um, commercial environments, the most dominant sectors, for instance, would be the SMEs and in most instances, the informal sector. So when we borrow from these codes that have been developed for developed economies, they tend to speak to larger companies and listed entities very much to the detriment of the dominant sectors, which is the SMEs. SMEs, right. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Tumi, I'm also aware that Africa has recently made uh, strides and progress and that we have developed as a continent our own African principles. Can you tell us why was this necessary? Well, it's a very exciting time, I believe, for state-owned enterprises and for our entities altogether. Um, because the development of these codes and principles will ensure that, first of all, we understand as the African continent our own socio-cultural influences in terms of how we do business, in terms of our own commercial environments. So therefore, whatever codes have been developed speak to and are relevant to our own commercial environments. And what that will do is that it will promote compliance because there can be very little compliance if codes are not relevant to your own commercial um, and, um, system. So we're very excited and we're also very encouraged by the fact that SOEs themselves in some countries, uh, let's say for instance, Ghana has recently developed its own code of um, corporate governance for the SOEs in the country. We also know that the same has been done in Egypt and South Africa is in the process of doing the same. So with regards to SOEs, there's definitely a need and a push currently to ensure that you know, we improve governance of SOEs so that we ensure that they play the important role that they, have intended, that they were intended to play in our economies. So Ms. Tumi, you've asked us to be cautious uh, in borrowing um, some of the lessons directly from the Western world in terms of corporate governance. But are there some other areas and other geographic spaces that we could perhaps learn from? So for example, is there any learning that we can pick from Southeast Asia in terms of SOEs? Uh, 
Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, Southeast Asia, I think we, we've all seen the phenomenal growth that has come from there. And we've also seen how some of that growth has been driven by the SOEs. Um, if you look, for instance, at Singapore, you know, and China. Um, and so, yes, there's a, we, we need to be looking more and more to some of our counterparts in the South, South regions of the world. And I think that we're already starting to do that work. Certainly from the APRM perspective, we have looked at how some of the, those countries in Southeast Asia have been able to develop through a very well-governed um, SOE sector. And that comes with its own, obviously, um, policy implications for our countries, which means that you need to have a very competent bureaucracy in place if you are going to take that, if you're going to move ahead with um, ensuring that the SOEs play such a critical role in the development of the country. But of course, with corporate governance practices, being at the forefront of those that are driving these kinds of policy discussions, there is no reason for us to believe that we could not, in fact, emulate um, our counterparts in the South-South regions. And we've just spoken about um, Southeast Asia, but if you look at Latin America, similarly, um, countries such as maybe not so much at the moment, Brazil, but um, um, you, you know, there's Colombia, which has done very well, and in Asia, still India. So, I mean, you're quite right that um, our focus has got to not necessarily shift, but we have to broaden it in terms of saying, where, where are some of the lessons that, that we could learn from? Where could those come from, other than just looking at the West? Ms. Tumi, you mentioned earlier on in this discussion, the African peer review mechanism and the role of the APRM. And so at this point, I'd like to ask you, what can African governments as a whole do better and more of to support the APRM? Well, I'm glad you asked more of, because I believe that um, our governments have actually started very much, um, you know, to be supportive of this work because there's a, a clear understanding backed up by research, of course, that all development, the foundation of development should be good governance. And so, you know, at APRM, we have um, member states, about 42 member states out of 55 that are already members of APRM. And what that means is that these countries have voluntarily come forward and said, how do we make sure that good governance practices forms the bedrock of our growth and development. And of course, there are still other countries that we are looking to ensuring that they join APRM. Um, but those countries that have joined and the countries that have actually undertaken what we call at APRM country reviews, what they do is we conduct country reviews in these countries. We look at a whole range of governance areas, starting from political governance, democratic governance, economic governance and corporate governance. We assess them and then we give them a set of recommendations in terms of how a country can improve. So what we've seen is that more and more countries are beginning to take up the recommendations that have been made by APRM. And so when you ask the question, what more of can they do? I believe that the more they, they can do is really to ensure that the recommendations that come out of the APRM review our methods are incorporated into the national development processes of a country, because that can only be a mechanism to ensure that we support, we truly support the countries, because without the incorporation of the recommendations, then you will find that the work that's been done by the APRM and the expertise that has been brought on by all the experts that we bring on board really doesn't bear the fruit that we yeah. all hope. As we're coming to the end of our discussion today, Ms. Tumi, what would be your general final words and thoughts in terms of how we can now move forward? And I ask this in light of what we have been through as, as both a continent, but also as the world over the past two years in terms of the impacts and the effects of COVID. Um, and I'm sure that this has impacted also in the way in which we think about 
SOEs and the way in which we think about corporate governance. So what would be your message to us? What have you learned and how can we move forward? Yeah, yeah. You know, you, you're quite right about that, that um, the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic has brought about so many shifts in how we do things and some of the priorities that we need to be focusing on as a continent. Within the space of corporate governance, I would say that um, we are no different, you know, in the sense that we've had to look and say, is the way in which we do corporate governance on the continent, does it serve our people? Does it serve the interests of those that we do the work for? And the answer has been that COVID-19 has taught us a lot. I mean, if you look at some of them um, over the past two years, and I must mention as well that when I spoke earlier on about the development of the codes of corporate governance, we started just before the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, and then COVID came. And what that taught us is that we saw so many private sector and public sector collaborations on the continent. We saw how most private companies came on board um, over and above just the manner, the manner in which they donated some of the funds in order to fight the pandemic. We saw private sector companies that were very much involved in research and innovation in trying to find some of the solutions to this pandemic. Right. Research and innovation with regards to how um, to try and finding, for instance, creating masks. We also saw research being done with regards to the vaccinations, but all of these were collaborations and cooperation between the public and the private sector. And what that has made us realize is that, you know, the public and the private sector can no longer continue to act in silos. And if we can take those kinds of learnings that we, we had that were necessitated by the brutality of COVID-19 and say, how can we make sure that we go forward using this model because it worked. And, and when we, you know, the, the new codes of corporate governance plays a very critical role on the private sector to, to make a significant contribution to development of a country to addressing some of the issues, some of the challenges in a country. And with COVID-19, that happened, even without the codes in place, because everybody was affected. The levels of employment were affected. So what we have learned is that corporate governance should not be inward looking. It should not just be about how does a, a company make its decisions or what are the processes involved in making sure that in controlling a company, but companies should also be involved in developing. Companies should also be involved in supporting some of the social initiatives in a country and in which they operate. And, and that in my view should be part of corporate governance. You know, we have in Southern Africa, what we call Ubuntu, which is when I grew up, we would say, Umuntu, Umuntu Ngabandi, you, I exist because of you, you exist because of me. So that surely extends to corporations. Ms. Tumi, that, that, that's really insightful. Um, and, and I think it's, it's important what you've just said in terms of taking corporate governance out of that pocket that is often been put in as something that just deals with corporations and entities and bring it into this bigger, uh, larger discussion uh, that we have about socioeconomic development um, and really give it the space and, and, and the role that, that, that it has, but often has, be, has not been looked at um, in, in that light. And I think what you, what, what you, what you talked about, uh, I think in Kiswahili, we, we, we say utu, which I think speaks to, to humanity. That, that we're all in, 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 this, in this together. And so I think today's conversation has just has helped us to bring this concept that I think many have thought to be just about corporations, but to now, to, we're starting to now bring it into the mainstream discussions on socioeconomic development of our own individual countries, but also as a continent um, at large. And so to, to, to wrap up, what would be your one big ask? What would be your one big ask to us as individuals, 
us as individual countries and us as a continent? Well, that's a very difficult one, but I will try to answer it as much as possible. And I think it goes back to what I spoke about just a short while ago, uh, the philosophy of Ubuntu, that as individuals, we accept that we have a responsibility to the next person. We, we accept as a matter of course that as an African, I am because you are. However, when you get to the next level of our existence, which is the corporations, you know, corporations in law are persons, but they are juristic persons. However, we don't, we don't expect corporations to also embrace this concept and this philosophy that we as Africans say we live by, which is the philosophy of Ubuntu. And I believe that that philosophy should extend to each one of us as individuals, as corporations. Of course, corporations by themselves don't have minds of their own, but they have leaders. They have leaders who drive their who drive that decision making. And so the ask is those leaders within those corporations should embrace the philosophy of Ubuntu to, a, to actually acknowledge that these companies would not make such huge profits without the people, number one, that work for them, without the people who are a part of the population in the country okay. and that buy and use the services that they provide. And again, similarly, it goes, to the governments. You know, our government, we're talking about SOEs, they hold these national assets for and on behalf of the people. And again, the concept of Ubuntu in terms of the political leadership, the economic leadership, that we should all be driven by this philosophy that at the center of what we do is for the betterment of the people of our country, the people of our continent. And I think that we will all be better for it if we can draft policies that are based or embraced by the very concept by which we believe in as Africans. So that would be my ask. And I believe that if we can start there as Africans, rather than starting abroad and looking at what are they doing on the other side of the ocean that we could also use? Let's start internally and say, what is it about us? What is, has been good about us that has worked, which is where we must then start. So that would be my ask. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tumi. I think you've articulated so well. I, I, I'm scared to, to, to continue uh, to, to add uh, more of my own words. And, and I think um, you pointing to, the, to us embracing our African uniqueness. I think that's something that we need to do more of um, as a Absolutely. continent, as a people. And I think these type of discussions that, that Uwongozi Institute um, is initiating um, is a symbol of exactly that. Just realizing that even for us here sitting in Tanzania. Thank you so much, Namaka. This has been a really lovely, engaging conversation. And I've learned a lot from you too. And I, I think that Uwangozi is doing a really wonderful job in ensuring that you draw on experiences from a very wide, diverse a range of leaders and expertise from across the continent, because I truly believe we have so much to learn from one another. So I very much look forward to engaging further with you and to becoming more involved with the work that you're doing at the Uwangozi Institute. Thank you so much for the invitation. It was a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank much you very much. That was wonderful. Thank you for your time. Thank you.